Does anybody know where the Clouds Creek Massacre's at? I tell you, to, to me, this is one of the most sacred sites in Lawrence County, and if, if not America. And, and, and I'll say that probably the most gruesome event of the Revolutionary War, if not in the top ten of gruesome events, happened right here where we are standing. Uh, I, I would like to ask for a moment of silence. Thank you, because this place really is special. But, um, of course, associated with this is Bloody Bill Cunningham, and I'm going to describe Bloody Bill Cunningham and his career in a little bit. Um, this it was called Hayes Station. It was a stagecoach stop. Um, I don't know exactly where the stage was going from, perhaps down to Charleston, something like that. But their old stagecoach road, you know, ran through here. And this was the plantation home place of Colonel Joseph Hayes. 
and um, he'd been here for, you know, a while and so forth. Um, he was here during the first Cherokee War, which happened from uh, 1758 to 1761, and that was the end of the French and Indian War. So what the settlers did at that time, who lived along the Indian boundary, and Lawrence County was the edge of civilization. Uh, if you went up into Greenville County, you were in uh, Cherokee territory, and it was illegal for any person of European descent to be in Cherokee uh, territory unless they had a passport. But, um, so, uh, Colonel Hayes had his plantation house here. This was a block house built on top of this hill. I suppose, now, a lot of what I'm saying today is supposition, but um, the fact that the DAR decided to put this monument here in 1910 adds a lot of credence to what you know we're talking about. I would love to see an archaeological study done here, and that really needs to be one of the next things that, that is done. But um, there was a blockhouse here that the settlers built for protection. And about every 20 miles along the um, Cherokee territory border was these whole series of blockhouses. Now, um, one Lawrence County historian whom I respect a lot, Roy Christie, who he's the one that rediscovered Fort Lindley after it was lost for 200 years. I don't know where he got this number, but he says that a, a blockhouse was here that was uh, 10 feet deep and 30 feet long. And that's not very big. But um, that's sort of what the setting was here. Uh, one account says that there was a plantation house down the hill which I'm assuming would have been close to that creek down there. And then this blockhouse was built on top of the hill. So this site is so um, totally connected with Bloody Bill Cunningham. Uh, he was a uh, one of the famous Cunningham family. Now the Cunningham family was very distinguished. Um, his two cousins were um, Patrick Cunningham and Robert Cunningham. And Patrick Cunningham was involved um, early on uh, with the snow campaign. He stole shot and powder from the Cherokee, uh, from the Patriots at Mine Creek. He wanted to give it to the Cherokees, but the Patriots were incensed over that. They wanted to curry favor with the Cherokees. So, um, uh, Patrick Cunningham fled to um, the, the wildest place he could think of, which was a cane break on the Reedy River. It's about seven miles from my house. Um, and uh, the Patriot forces, they were down at Hollingsworth Mill, which is over that way. Um, they sent a flying column of 1,300 men to surround Cunningham. Um, Patrick Cunningham escaped. Uh, he had 200 men with him, 130 were captured, 70 got away. He was one of them that got away. But his brother, Robert Cunningham, was the most ardent loyalist in the back country. Robert Cunningham was a very influential man here. He got elected the state senator from, um, this was the Little River District at that time. Um, during the middle of the war, 1778, from Little River District, Lawrence County, they elect a Tory to be their state senator. <laughs> Patrick Cunningham was elected to be a state representative. They were very well respected, and that shows how divided Lawrence County was during that time. That was a true civil war. And these men knew each other. That's what I'm saying. Colonel Hayes is, lives here. Um, Buddy Bill Cunningham is with the Cunningham family over in the Long Canes um, area. Patrick Cunningham lives just a few miles from here at Rosemont. That's a very distinguished plantation. Um, that's a gem for, for Lawrence County. <coughs> but William Cunningham, Bloody Bill Cunningham, started out as a patriot. He um, joined the Patriot forces against his cousin, Patrick Cunningham, who's in the cane break. And, and William Cunningham is part of that force of 1,300 men that surround his cousin, and his cousin gets away. So he's a Patriot. What he says was, 
he signs up as a patriot as long as he can stay within 50 miles of his house, of his home. And that's what the militiamen wanted. They, they didn't want to go far out. They wanted to protect their home, forget what's happening 100 miles away. I want to be safe right here in my area. Well, uh, William Cunningham's um, uh, command was transferred to Charleston. He didn't like that. And he starts being insubordinate. And his commanding officer says, well, I'm not going to have any of this. And so he tied him to a post and publicly whipped him with 50 lashes. Ooh. So Bloody Bill Cunningham, <coughs> right after that happened, he deserts. He goes to um, East Florida. And then when the British take uh, Savannah in 1778, he goes to Savannah. So when he's in Savannah, he gets news, some bad news about his family up here. And what had happened was this uh, patriot, uh, he was a captain, Captain William Ritchie, but he was a plundering uh, captain. He was a plundering patriot. You know, there were plunderers on both sides. There were bad guys on both sides. William Ritchie was a bad guy who was on the patriot side. So he goes to uh, William Cunningham's father's <coughs> plantation farm, whatever it was, and he, you know, abuses the father terribly to find out where Bloody Bill was or whatever. Bloody Bill's um, um, brother was <clears throat> an invalid. Um, I think he had bad epilepsy or something like that. So he was at home. Well, Bloody Bill Cunning, oh, no, William Ritchie abuses the uh, brother so bad that the brother dies. Mm -hmm. He abuses the father, and he abuses the brother so bad that the father died. So William Cunningham got that information when he was in Savannah. He walked 180 miles from Savannah in six days to the home of, of William Ritchie. And he pulls uh, Ritchie out by the scruff of his neck and throws him down in the front yard and shoots him dead in front of his family. So that's just warming up for <laughs> So, um, you know, the, uh, the war continues. Um, the, the British are forced into Charleston. Uh, you know, the British lose, you know, Kings Mountain, Cowpens, Utah Springs, Siege of 96, all of that. They're losing, losing, losing. So they're just in an enclave in Charleston. And they were in Charleston for the last 18 years of the war, 18 months of the war, um, before they finally sailed away. And there wasn't a lot going on. There wasn't a lot of fighting in between those forces. You know, the British were hardly making forays. They were being supplied by sea. They weren't going anywhere. They were surrounded 18 months of that. Upstate loyalists were living as refugees in Charleston at that time. Well, Cornwallis, you know, does his thing, finally winds up in Yorktown, and he's bottled in by the French fleet, and um, Cornwallis uh, surrenders. That was on uh, uh, October the 18th, 1781. So everybody's, you know, thinking that the war is over. Um, you know, celebrating and, and all that sort of thing. And uh, Joseph Hayes, with a solid core of his uh, Little River Regiment, about 35 uh, men, according to one uh, uh, record that I, that I read. See, I, I hear a lot of conflicting information about what happened and how and so forth. And when I have that, I give both sides of the story, you know, and y'all decide which one you like the best, and that's the one you can do. <laughs> but, and that's what I do. But anyway, um, so, uh, you know, one account says that uh, Colonel Hayes and 35 men are eating dinner, lunch, or whatever at his plantation house. Now, at this time, I'm going to switch gears because I'm, that's the bloody bell part of this story. I want to talk about the men of 
the Little River District now, present day Lawrence County. Um, the men that fought with the Little River Regiment. And the Little River Regiment is made up of um, um, Patriot militiamen, farmers, who sign up for 30 days or whatever, do that little fight and come back and plant their crops. They have one of the most distinguished records of any regiment in the entire Revolutionary War. Anybody who is a descendant of the Little River Regiment should really feel proud because these guys did well. I will point out that there was another um, uh, Lawrence County uh, fight, fight man who was the fightingest guy in the entire war. And his name was David Fanning, and he was a loyalist. But um, Lawrence County produced a lot of very successful and active uh, military men. I'm not going to go, I mean, the engagements of the Little River Regiment, 49 different engagements. You know, the Snow Campaign, the, the Cherokee War of 1776, the first siege of, of 96, and the second siege of 96, Augusta. All of these battles they fought in, they were victorious. They fought under Andrew Pickens. They were instrumental in what happened when the tide turned at Musgrove Mill. So, uh, the entire war in South Carolina changed when the British took Charleston in May 12, 1780. It was a sea change. Andrew Williamson, who was the general Andrew Williamson, defected to the British. He was called the South Benedict Arnold, even though he may have been a spy. But anyway, <laughs> that's what Nathaniel Green said. But um, Andrew Pickens, my hero. He surrendered to the British. He said, if, if you protect me, I will go under your protection. If you protect me, I will sit in my house the rest of the war, and uh, I won't take up arms against you. Against you. Uh, Robert Anderson, namesake of uh, Anderson City and County, second under um, uh, Pickens. He surrendered. The only... Uh, officer, or the leading officer of the Little River Regiment who did not surrender was James Williams. And there's several Williams family members here. James Williams had a plantation two miles away, right over there. He had a fort there, Fort Williams, and there was some fighting and so forth going on, and the fort got burned down. But uh, James Williams was the most ardent <coughs> patriot in the uh, um, in Lawrence County, I told you Robert Cunningham was the most ardent uh, loyalist. James Williams was the most ardent patriot, and he was not going to surrender to the um, uh, loyalist forces or the British forces who were in charge. He wasn't going to do that. So he had a band of about 60 men. Isaac Shelby at this time comes over the mountains from Tennessee with his over mountain boys. Uh, Isaac Shelby was in South Carolina twice. His first foray, he comes in, he captures Fort Thickety. I'm doing some work there. He has some fights in um, uh, Spartanburg County. They were fighting over peach orchards and stuff like that. He, he, he was in Spartan County. Elijah Clark came up from Georgia with 60 men. Shelby, Williams, Clark. They joined together up at uh, Grendel Shoals, I believe it is, in uh, uh, Spartanburg County. And they got word that there was a 200-man um, militia contingent at Musgrove Mills in Lawrence County, where Lawrence County joined Spartanburg and Union <coughs> County on the Ennery River. That was a uh, loyalist outpost. So Shelby and the other group, they're like, hey, man, 200, we got 200, let's go get them. They rode all night long, 40 miles to Musgrove Mill. What they did not know and what they found out shortly after they arrived in place was that 
uh, a British force of militia 400 strong was coming through on the way to 96 and they decided to stop at Musgrove Mill that night. So the next morning, these 200 men with the Little River Regiment and James Williams, they get to Musgrove Mill and they all of a sudden they're faced with 600 people. Well, they rode all night long. Their horses were wore out. They were like, what do we do now? Um, and they came up with a plan just, you know, immediately. What they did was they were at the top of an old in uh, Indian agricultural field, had a lane down the middle, and they quickly created a breastworks 300 yards long out of fallen trees and brush and saplings and stuff like that. They were hiding behind trees with their, with their rifles. Shadrach Enman, I told you Andrew Pickens is a hero of mine. Shadrach Enman is a, definitely a hero of mine. He was with uh, Clark's um, group in, um, in Georgia, with Elijah Clark. He, he came up with a plan that he would charge the um, loyalist forces. So he, <clears throat> he charged right to the um, loyalist with about 15 or 20 men and they were hooping and hollering and shouting and shooting and as soon as they got within range of the loyalist they turned around and came back and the one said well, what's going on what's you know and and he would charge him again and they would charge back after him and so he would um, do a whole series of charge charges till he drew the British forces in towards that rudimentary breastworks and when the uh, Loyalist forces got 110 yards away, they fired their muskets. Well, muskets are only accurate from 75 yards. That did absolutely no good whatsoever. And um, so, uh, you know, they, they kept charging, kept charging. Now they're, you know, loading their muskets, whatever. They got bayonets. But they get within about 50 yards of the uh, Patriot forces, and those guys let loose with their volley and it just decimates, um, you know, the charging forces. And they were in disarray, and their commander got wounded in the back of the neck and knocked off his horse. So 200 Patriots with James Williams and 60 men of the Little River Regiment and help from Shelby and Clark, they defeat um, the uh, Tories at Musgrove Mill, the 600 Tories at Musgrove Mill. After that, James Williams was leading the 49th, of the, excuse me, the uh, Little River Regiment at Kings Mountain. They surrounded the uh, Ferguson there, killed 150 of his 900 men, captured 600. At Kings Mountain, James Williams, with his plantation two miles over here, he's the last casualty that the uh, Patriots had at Kings Mountain. And many people say that he was shot after um, the British raved the white flag. So he's like, oh, they surrendered. He's walking around and then he gets shot. And he had a controversial death. There's several rumors to his death. I'm not going to get into that. But um, anyway, um, when uh, Williams is killed, Joseph Hayes becomes the commander, Colonel Joseph Hayes, becomes the commander of the Little River Regiment. And he was at Cowpens. And um, the Little River Regiment played a crucial part in the victory at Cowpens. Pickens had his militia lined up, four regiments, you know, right next to each other. They had skirmishers out front. The British started advancing. The skirmishers shooted the British officers. When the um, uh, British line gets too close, the skirmishers come back in to the ranks. Well, if you've got four regiments lined up shoulder to shoulder, and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of skirmishers running through your line, you don't want that. That disrupts your line. So what uh, Joseph Hayes and the Little River Regiment did was they advanced 20 paces. So suddenly now, they're out there by their lonesome, they got support on the flanks. The skirmishers come through, and right on the tail of the skirmishers are the British lines. So Pickens gives the order to fire. His uh, 
Regiment on the left, Brandon, they fire and they mow down a bunch of British. Then Hayes fires, boom, he flips and blows down a bunch of British. Then the second on the left fires, uh, that was Roebuck, and um, he kills a bunch of British. And then Anderson on the right, they fire. By the time that happens, Brandon's loaded again, he fires. And there was a solid line of red uh, coats laying on the ground where the British line met the um, Andrew Pickens militia with the Little River Regiment playing a crucial role. See, these guys, they're 20 paces ahead. They had the highest rate of casualties of any group, uh, any regiment at Cowpens. Their orders were to fire and retreat. So they did, they followed orders. And they so they start retreating. Um, through, you know, the Continental Line, which was behind them, they went around and they regrouped in the back. So, and the British thought, oh, those guys are giving up. So they start charging, they start charging, and they charge into the Continentals, and, you know, I mean, that was just an absolute massacre. Then the um, Little River Regiment worked in the, in the mop up of that whole thing. So they were very active at the last phase of the war, too. But that's quickly, you know, um, cowpens, and we're going to see cowpens next. By the way, in four weeks, um, the third Saturday in October, we're going to go to cowpens, and you can see what these men did there. So Hayes was instrumental in the victory at cowpens. There's just nothing, you know. Two days before cowpens. <coughs> There was a group of loyalists coming through um, to join up with Tarleton men, these loyalists from Georgia, to, to, to join up with, with uh, Tarleton. Well, William Washington, the cavalry leader, George Washington's second cousin, gets word that this militia group from uh, Georgia is marching through. So he says, okay, well, we're going to go attack those. And he picks up the, the group that uh, is, knows this area, which is the Little River Militia. So uh, Joseph Hayes and uh, William Washington attack that group of Georgia militia at Hammond Store, which is about 10 miles over there. So the story is the militia was um, camped there eating lunch. They had their rifles stacked. There, there was a gully and a stream down below. William Washington comes to the top of the hill opposing the gully, sees the British, the uh, loyalist camp there. He charges down the hill and then back up through, and he goes through the ranks of those fellas sitting there eating lunch or whatever, slashing and hacking as he goes. And then when he gets through the camp, he turns around and he comes back through again slashing and hacking. Joseph Hayes is the infantry report for support on that. So at Hammond store, 10 miles away, two days before cowpens, there were 100 loyalist casualties. There were zero patriot casualties. Now I wonder why that is. Was that a massacre? Could have been. Um, there are various reports on that. And Joseph Hayes was the uh, commander of the infantry during, during that uh, assault. And that happened eight months before this did. So um, the British are holed up in Charleston. Cunningham's there. He's just seething. Uh, he's got a score to settle. Uh, he may have known somebody at Hammond store. He may have been friends or whatever. So he gets sent under orders of the, you know, British garrison. He gets sent with 300 men to settle scores before the British were going to leave. And so he comes out with 300 men and uh, he encounters a group of patriots that are Again, you know, eating, gathered together, whatever, at a place called Clouds Creek. And he surrounds them and he slaughters those 27 men at Clouds Creek. 
Um, two days later, he's coming coming through. And uh, <coughs> he goes to the Williams Plantation first. Now, one story I say I read says that he saw smoke rising from the um, Williams Plantation, so he knew that Bloody Bill was on the loose at that time. And so he gathers his men where they were eating lunch. They eat a lot of lunch back then. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they skedaddle up and they get in this blockhouse that was built during the first Cherokee War. Uh, it's 10 feet by 30 feet. And, uh, you know, cedar shingles, that sort of thing. It was, it was a log fort. And uh, the other story that I've heard was that there was somebody at the Williams plantation, Benjamin Goodman, and when he saw Bloody Bill coming, he ran up, he, he rode his horse over to um, Joseph Hayes and gives them the warning, and that's when Joseph Hayes comes and sets foot up here. The man who gave that warning was Benjamin Goodman. Benjamin Goodman could have ridden the other way, but he didn't. He came here, he tried to save uh, Hayes' command, and he paid the ultimate price for that. You know, I, I would like to know something about every single um, man's name on this marker here. I don't, I don't know all of these men. And, and I, I hate it for that. I'm, I'm kind of on a mission to find out something about all of them. <coughs> but um, when, when Cunningham got here, you know, there was some talk. They said, oh, if you, know, if you surrender now, you know, you'll be saved or whatever. And a shot rang out. One of Cunningham's men was killed. And uh, so Cunningham's just incensed about that. And they load up the ramrods on their muskets and they wrap them in uh, a rags and so forth and put pitch or something on them and, and shoot flaming musket ramrods into the house, part of the blockhouse. And just to make sure that didn't that work just fine, they, uh, I think there was a blacksmith shop or something around here, and they heated up ingots and threw them under the roof. And anyway, the place caught on fire. So... The inhabitants of the fort there, you know, they surrendered, said, well, you treat us prisoners of war, we'll surrender, yeah, 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 we'll do that. So they had made them come out one at a time, they had tied their hands behind their backs. And then, once they had them all with their hands tied behind their backs, they took a big rope and they tied them all together and said, okay, you know, we're going to march you down to Charleston. Well, as soon as that last rope was tied, they said, ha ha, we got you now. Uh, we're going to do with you whatever we want. One account states that the hanging started then. Another account says the next morning the hanging started. But there were, by one report, there were either 25 or 35 men originally in Hayes' um, command. 18 were killed. So what about those other folks? You know, there are records of this... Um, um, occurrence here, I'm not going to call it a battle, um, and it lists several men who were just captured for one day or several men who escaped, and the 300 men who were here that had, had these prisoners, they allowed some of these men to go free, and one of them was Jonathan Downs, I didn't tell you about him, he was the leader of, uh, he was the original uh, colonel of the Little River Regiment fought at the ring fight. He was wounded, shot through the hand and through the abdomen. That musket ball stayed in his belly for the rest of his life. But he became inactive in uh, August of 1776. But he was here with the rest of the Little River Regiment uh, three or four years later, you know, having lunch with him or anything. They let him go. They let Jonathan Downs go and there's a few others that they let go as well. So they've got the men tied. 
um, you know, with the hands behind their back, and say the next morning, Cunningham starts to hang them, and there was a fodder pole around here that you'd use to stack hay with. Yeah. And he's going to hang Joseph Hayes and Captain Daniel Williams at the same time. Captain Daniel Williams is the son of James Williams, whose plantation is right over there. Captain Williams was 18 years old. So, um, Cunningham was going to tie, tie them, uh, hang them both at the same time off a fodder pole. Well, the fodder pole broke. And uh, uh, Bloody Bill got so incensed that that happened that he started hacking away. Mm -hmm. So, one of the stories is that um, there's another Williams name on this stone, Joseph Williams. Joseph Williams was 14 years old, and he was with his brother, Captain Daniel Williams, and as uh, Daniel Williams is about to be hung, uh, Joseph Williams says, Oh brother, oh brother, what shall I tell our mother? And Bloody Bill turned to the 14-year-old boy and said, You'll tell her nothing, you damn rebel suckling. And he stabbed him right through the belt. Hewed him down. So if that story is true, Daniel uh, Joseph Williams was the first death here. Another story says, as um, his brother and Joseph Hayes are about to be hung, Joseph Williams turns to Bloody Bill Cunningham and says, Captain Cunningham, what shall I tell my mother? And Cunningham looks at him and says, I'll save you that onerous task. And he hung him. But I believe the, the chopping and the hacking story more because nope, these men were not hung. They were, they were cut to pieces. Um, there's, there were 18 men killed that day. The families of four of those men were able to identify the bodies and they took them off for private burial. The bodies of the other 14 men, you couldn't tell whose arm belonged to whose head or whose torso. So they were buried in two common graves. And as far as I know, we're standing on top of those two common graves. There needs to be an archaeological study here. I have, there's no reports of these graves being found and dug up. So I believe that there's 14 men buried right under here. Um, so, you know, the, the killing went on. Um, John Neal, his father... Um, burned down Richard Paris's plantation on the banks of the Reedy River at the end of the, the uh, Liberty Bridge where the waterfall is in Greenville. His father, uh, uh, Thomas Neal Sr., was uh, um, a colonel who died in the Battle of Stone Oak. Thomas Neal, or John Neal, had two brothers that were twins, and both of them were colonels in the um, militia. And both of them were killed. John Neal is killed. The entire Neal family, the, the men in the Neal family were killed. And there, there were uh, sisters. But, you know, the sacrifices that were made are incredible. The Williams family, the Neal family, the Irby family. Three people on here. Joseph Irby Sr., Joseph Irby Jr., Grief Irby. That's three men of the same family. Irby was a distinguished family around here. And uh, they left a father, a son, and I'm not sure if that was a, a brother or a cousin. Uh, I don't know Christopher Hardy, Lieutenant Christopher Hardy. Clement Hancock, 
John Milvin, James Ferris, John Cook, Yancey Saxon. Okay. I don't know these men. I want to get to know them. But um, after Bloody Bill um, killed here, he went into Spartan County. He made a loop throughout the entire, entire state. And he killed 76 men in his much long excursion. Um, he was a, you know, psychopathic killer. After the war, his cousin, Robert uh, Cunningham, who was the militia general for the uh, Loyalist militia, uh, Robert Cunningham went to the Bahamas where he received a pension from the British government for the rest of his life. Bloody Bill Cunningham went to the Bahamas and lived with his cousin. And he lived there for six years till after the war. And then he died under unexplained circumstances. Some say he was poisoned. Some say he died of syphilis. Um, or whatever. We hope he didn't have a very pleasant end. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the story of Hay Station. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Would they bury those British men that were killed? They killed that line. Would they bury them? Uh, no, they would. They would bury them, but it can. It depended on the circumstances. Okay. Uh, if they had 300 prisoners, they may say 15 of you prisoners bury those guys, but they left quick from the cow pens, because Cornwallis, you know, was, was still around, um, and a lot of times the families would bury, you know, the prisoners. Yes? Uh, you said that they let, like, half of them go. Uh-huh. Uh, would they just do that because they had, like, family or something? Yeah, they had some close association. You know, Jonathan Downs, there was a lot of respect for him. Uh, and some of these people were good guys, and uh, they may have saved a man or a man's family. Um, they fought together, the, the Patriots and the Loyalists fought together against the enemy, against the Indians, excuse me. There are some individuals in the Revolutionary War that got pensions from the Patriot side and pensions from the Loyalist side because they fought in both units. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, and, and fought with the students. Yes. You said in your email that you just recently discovered this site is owned by the county yes. of Lauren. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and if there's any plans for this site? Uh, this site was originally purchased <coughs> by the um, uh, Lawrence County Historical Commission. <coughs> And I don't know how long they had it. This is a one square acre site that is landlocked by a 1,200 acre hunt club. So there's some question about, you know, easement and that sort of thing. That's a legal question. But um, so when the Lawrence County Historical Commission disbanded, they were supposed to give it to another you know, historical group or whatever. But I don't think anybody ever really stepped up and said, hey, we'll take it or whatever. So it just kind of languished. And somehow or another, as a result, or however these things work, it's now owned by the county. So the county owns one uh, acre right here. And the county has started to do maintenance. In the last uh, uh, four weeks, We've done a fair, a really a good bit of cleanup here. Um, wisteria, you can see it in there. Uh, this was completely overtaking the site. Oh. That's a label there, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> so you can see where I've started to spray wisteria and cut it down and so forth. And the, the um, county has mowed. The county is starting to take um, uh, maintenance over here. As far as what the end result is going to be, I don't know. I mean, that's that's up to county county council what they want to do with this area, this or this spot. 
this spot has tremendous potential for tourist development, but we've got to take into account the um, concerns of the hunt club. And I don't know if this place should even be open during hunting season, no. which right now is bow season. But, um, and it's unfortunate because uh, this incident occurred on November the 19th, um, and you'd like to have a commemoration here every November. But that's the middle of hunting season. So, that's getting me determined. Wow. Yes. Where was the blockhouse? Do we know this? Are you probably standing on it. That's what I, I, the high point. It would have been the high point. I, but that's why I wanted to get the archaeologists out here. I, yeah. I was going to ask if this was a blockhouse, do we have any idea where the old station was? Uh, the, the tavern and such. I would think it would be close to the water. That's what, yeah. yeah. Down toward the creek or. or yeah. Oh. Yeah. Down toward the creek. Yes. I think Joe Edwards had something to do with it, pass it into the council. Okay. Yeah, um, years ago. Cause um, and they're right over there, that hill over there is called Hayes Mountain. Right. I don't know if you told everybody that. Uh, yeah, we went over that briefly. Now, and here's something else I read that on the same day that this was happening at Hayes Station, there was a battle on Hayes Mountain with a different group altogether <laughs> not associating with this. And Colonel William Washington and his cavalry was one of the um, groups that was up there. But, you know, a separate battle going on there. I've also read that a man was standing on that mountain and he saw what happened here. Yes. You said the future of the site is still up in question. Is there any danger of anything you know, bad happening with the site? Or, uh, Look, we're dealing with government here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anything can happen. That's right. I would say the worst thing that would happen would be if somehow access was denied. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. And I've talked with the son of the fellow who owns this. Very nice guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't see him. Cool. You can't landlock a piece of land. Yeah, yes, hey, you can. We'll have to talk to the lawyers about it. <laughs> I can't do it. Yes. Is there any uh, any information about the gold hid over there? On the no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, that, that's why you want the archaeologist. <laughs> Oh, this is the leanest iron fence ever. No, this, you, this, I'd kind of like to take it down so I could work inside it. In the 1900s, the DAR put these things up everywhere. They're out in the woods, you know, 10 miles or 4 miles from where I live. There's a um, Revolutionary War, uh, he was a minute man from uh, New York, or Virginia rather, and uh, he got granted some land. It's in the middle of the woods right now, but it's got this fence around it. Um, very well, good. They need to put some more on the house under the statue. Could be. Amen. Could be. Absolutely. Yes. First time I came here, I was 12 years old. Oh, yeah. Wow. They broke them tombstones inside of that. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? No. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The first time I came here, I was 12 years old. I came with my father. We came off the highway. You know, probably the old road to the Yeah, top. yeah. And there were broken things inside of it. I couldn't tell you what the word right. was. What 12 year old pays attention to that? Yeah. <laughs> but actually, that was a previous monument that had fallen down. This one here was. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, it was probably the first mine broken in the 1850s, and if you go over to the Williams Cemetery over on Williams Plantation, same thing. Is that, that's what I was hearing, yes. Is that Thank you. Yeah. I don't know anymore. <laughs> you, that's a great addition right there. They, had it, they, they opened it up several years ago for so ceremony over there. I missed it. Well, if there are no more questions, I guess that does it for today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Y'all follow me on Facebook.